All right, we should now be set and going with the recording of the final study guide. Here we are. Welcome to my humble abode. Here's the study guide for the final. Um, basically, we're going to begin with the first item on the list, which is Sykes-Picot Agreement. The Sykes-Picot Agreement, here's the map that it divided up the Middle East into. It was the agreement following World War One, if we remember, between the French, the British, and the Russian Empire. And the Ottoman Empire was going to be dissolved at the end of World War One because they lost. And so the British powers and the European powers decided to divide it up into different spheres of influence or protectorates, France, Britain, and Russia, right? So there's the signatories and the authors of the Lullaby Agreement. The agreement is important because it is the origin of the victims of a map metaphor. That's the title of the collection of work by Adonis and by Darwish. Um, there's more guys who drew it up and signed it. Da, 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 da. Um, this is in the study guide, of course, right? It was officially known as the Asia Minor Agreement, 1916 secret agreement between France, Britain, and the Russian Empire, sort of. They ascended to it, uh, and they divided up the spheres of influence in the southwest, southwestern Asia, i.e. the Middle East, the Near East. Right. Um, basically, the issue with this was it divided things along boundaries that were artificially imposed. There's no actual national history or origin for the countries that were created following the Sykes-Picot Agreement. It more or less uh, generically and indistinctly drew up these boundaries that the people who lived there would then split based upon sectarian guidelines or based upon artificial boundaries and created a lot of friction amongst the peoples who were living in the area previously, right? Right. So it's the issue that Darwish takes up. It's the issue that the map is the symbol for in the Arabic poetry, right? All right. So Adonis now is number two on our list. So Adonis's characteristics of his verse, right? Remember, he experiments with free verse. Before this Arabic, Arabic poetry, Arabic verse was never free verse. It was always highly regulated and rhymed and meter. And he kind of was the avant-garde, the first one to start breaking the rules with Arabic verse. Now, he also included things like variable meters. So he had a meter system in one of his poems, but not in the other. He would depend upon what he wanted to do. Before that, the meter was structured specifically by Quranic intonation and by different oral traditions that were facing or were traced back to Islamic society. Right? All right, prose poetry. Prose poetry, i.e. that poem that looks like a block of text, like a prose novel that does not have a uh, set line length or meter or rhyme to it. That reads like a story. Adonis does the first to do that in modern Arabic poetry, right? So he does that as well. Another thing about Adonis, he engages in themes of exile. He's a originally a, a sorry, Syrian poet who's then, because of his uh, radicalism or his willingness to break the rules with poetry, is exiled to Lebanon where he goes to college and eventually founds two literary presses and starts the poetry movement there. So he's still not allowed back in Syria by the time he dies, and that's a problem for him. So exile is a point for him too. Transformation. He talks about the transformation not only of culture and of individuals mythologically, but also of individuals into spiritual or secular um, whole entities, right? The Arabic culture can be transformed through the use of poetry in new and interesting ways that prior to this, the poetic tradition in Islam and in Arabic culture did not allow for. That's his basis. His poetic voice is usually playful and prophetic, not morose and focusing on violence. He's a lot more happy and in general, you know, uh, witty with his words and with the things he talks about as opposed to uh, Darwish, who we'll see next. But uh, final thing about Adonis, he's the founder of Arabic language poetic modernism, i.e. modern poetry in the Arabic world traces itself back to Adonis. All right, Darwish. Now, Darwish is a little sadder of a guy. He's a Palestinian. He was born in Palestine. He's very occupied with the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. He's concerned a lot with anxiety and identity of Palestinians and anxiety and identity on a personal level. Right. He's concerned about Palestine's place in the world and the different European powers and the different UN resolutions that are trying to, he thinks, like delimitate the Palestinian uh, perspective or existence. Um, so he's opposed to Israel a lot of times and has ongoing tensions with Israel are reflected in his poetry. He's focused on exile, but not so much like Adonis is about longing for the homeland, but as an activist who's actively trying to break down borders and establish a new state that he can call home. Darwish is a lot more violent in his language, a lot more political overtly, and a lot more um, anxious towards Israel and the European powers in the Middle East. Um, he longs for in his poetry politically focused power, not just power or not just individuality or identity, but actual political power to change things with Israel, Palestinians, and the world. Um, separation or separatism politically. He favors separatism from Israel, like two-state solution is not quite enough for Darwish even. He wants like a one-state Palestinian solution where Israel has to break off and relinquish a lot of its territory. So that's his uh, site as well. He, he uh, writes about the concept of homeland in a way that is anti-Israeli uh, occupation, he calls it a lot of times, anti-Israel's existence a lot of other times, right? He um, 
focuses on violence in his poems and uses these poems and this violence as a political tool. So you'll see a lot of times violence in his poetry is being used for political ends, or the poetry itself is being used for political ends. That's how you tell his Darwish's poetry, right? Brandon Courtney's poetry. Uh, U.S. Navy guy, right? He writes beautifully in a very nice, pretty, formal, kind of like Shelley and Keats old school romantic poetry lines, right? Very regular lines. Doesn't have a lot of weird long lines, and he writes a lot of stuff that's in a good meter or has rhyme within it. Right? In his book we read, Inadequate Grave, it carries the themes of the Odyssey through, and it's in conversation with the Odyssey. Right? There's a subheading that says, "Here's lines from the Odyssey," and then his poems come up, and they give a reflection or a correlation of experience of his own based to that Odyssey um, theme or that Odyssey line. Right? He deals with mental health and homecoming a lot more than any other poet. He talks about mental health issues both in the U.S. and overseas. It talks about mental breakdown and PTSD in personal and in introverted kind of ways. Um, he's disenchanted with the military service. Like, largely, he's not in favor of or promoting kind of patriotism or that view. He's kind of had it with the military and the experience he had there. So it's a tone you can get in his poetry as well. Um, loss of friends. Remember, the inadequate grave is focused largely on the death of his best friend and what that did to him psychologically, physically, and with his military experience. Um... The sea, changing of the body into something beautiful, right? This is another of his themes he focuses on, is how through death even the sea can take the body and rework it into coral and something beautiful into a uh, transformative, transcendent experience that the body can never be before it dies, right? The ocean can reclaim the body for life in the afterlife, right? Um, reclamation of the body by nature, like I said, the whole idea of the body becoming dust, becoming the air in the earth, becoming the food for plants, becoming something that's reused, and is beautiful in that way too, right? And therefore the ocean is configured as a tomb in his poetry. The ocean is both grave and earth and mother and tomb, right? Okay. Um, next we have, oh yeah, the ocean is an insurmountable obstacle to humankind. Like it's something we can't master. It stands at the edge of all human experience and something we cannot overcome. It will overcome us. It will kill us. It will be our tomb. And because of that, uh, Courtney has a lot of uh, incomprehensible and insurmountable images for the ocean. All right, Landy's. Remember, these are the Afghani folk poems. They're 22 syllables in length. There are nine syllables in the first line and 13 in the second line. They're a spoken poem that's never written down or not usually until they were recorded by our intrepid Western reporters, right? So it's a oral tradition. They're subversive. They're body. They're lewd. They're sexual. They're, they're pr provocative, right? They're anti-patriarchal. They make fun of the men who are in charge in the society in Afghanistan either by ma making fun of their masculinity, their sexual prowess, or the lack thereof, or their um, ability to run a family or a war, their soldierly prowess, their political prowess. It chides them at all of this, right? It rewrites traditional folk themes by updating the language, right? So it became a, a shawl or a um, sleeve or an ankle in the old traditional landies is a bra strap or is cash money or is the internet now in the new... Uh, updated landies that are currently being written and recited, right? Landies are traditionally about one of five themes. Love, grief, loss, homeland, and war. Right? Those are the things to remember about landies. Malala. Remember, Malala is not the education activist uh, from India who got attacked by ISIS and hurt um, a couple of years ago. This is the woman whom that Malala was named after, who's an Afghani. And she was famous in because of the Battle of, Ma of Mawiwand, which is a uh, battle that the British fought against the Afghan forces in the second Anglo-Afghani conflict. And the legend and the myth as it goes is a young girl uh, against the dictates of a strict Afghan custom took off her veil and she roared and she waved it around like a flag and she said, Long, young love, if you do not fall in battle of Mawend, by God, someone is saving you as a symbol of shame. Right? So she's saying, die for your country now. This is the time we need you to fight and die. If you don't, then you're, we're ashamed of you. No woman's going to want you again. Right? Which is a landy she recited, yeah? So her name is Malala. At 19, she was from the village of Kig, which is close to where the battle happened. The customary um, status of a woman, she was on the battlefield tending to wounded and supplying the troops in, with water and medicine. So the legend is that it was the battle was on her wedding day, and her husband uh, and her father were both fighting the battle. And she was between the troops trying to help them out. She sensed the failing spirits of the Afghans because a lot of them were getting killed. She transformed and was cried out to the soldiers, momentarily diverting their attention from a near certain defeat. When she goaded the troops to lead the flag bearer, the Afghans were struck down by a bullet, so the flag bearer gets hot hit. She picks it up, and she, or she takes her veil off and uses it as a flag in some traditions, and then she recites an Afghan landy, which is, With a drop of my sweetheart's blood, shed in defense of the motherland, will I put a beauty spot on my forehead, such as I would put shame to the rose in the garden. So the Afghans were re-spirited, threw themselves again to battle again, kicked the British's butts, 
killed, you know, close to a thousand, I think, was it say close to a thousand British people in the battle and almost 3,000 Afghans died because they didn't have the technology or the uh, training as the Brits did. But it was a certain crushing defeat for the British. They actually, that was a whole about all the forces they had in Afghanistan. And that was kind of the end of the day for them. So that's both the Battle of Mauiland and Malala for the test. Uh, blood stripes and Marine Corps uniforms emblem or item given to NCOs. They wear as a red stripe down their legs um, and their uniforms, both service alphas and um, dress blue uniforms as well as service Charlies and Bravos too. The other thing is that the ceremony, it's pinned on literally. The strip of fabric is taken against the soldier or the Marine's um, leg and pinned on with nails through the, the garment. So there's actually a real blood stripe on the leg. And when you get that ceremony done, um, IED stands for Improvised Explosive Device. Know that. No, the Six-Day War was the war between Israel and Palestine when all the countries in the Middle East, especially Nasser and Egypt, kind of formulated it, attacked Israel. Um, Israel won decisively and reclaimed, or not reclaimed, claimed a lot of land that was previously occupied by the uh, Lebanese, Egyptian, and uh, Jordanian military. And so that's established new boundaries of Israel, which Darwish especially um, is not a fan of. But here's the whole history of the war. Know this. Um, the First Anglo-Afghan War. Right, was fought between the British East Indian Company and the Emirates of Afghanistan from 1938 to 42. Um, a bunch of British and Indian soldiers were lost, but more than um, triple that number of Afghans were, fought, were lost uh, because of the technology difference again. The second, second Anglo-Afghan War is from the Battle of Mauiland, where Malala um, myth comes from. Oh, there's a train in the background. Hang on. All right. So you can hear, there's the train. Da, 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 da. Cool. So anyways, the Afghan... Second Anglo-Afghan War. The Afghanistan was invaded again by the British and the Indian forces, who were British protectors at the time. The Battle of Mauiland and Malala happened during this war. Um, the ends in the Afghanistan's defeat and the establishment of a puppet regime in Brit in Afghanistan by the British government. So there's that. Battle of Mauiland again, July 27, 1880. It's where Malala comes from. It's a decisive victory and the only victory for the Afghans in that war. Um, parallel response is how Brandon Courtney's poetry interacts with the Odyssey in his collection, Inadequate Grave, right? There's a response or a line from the Odyssey, a section of quote, and then he responds to that with his own poetry and experience, right? Political rebellion and activism is Darwish's concept. It's the poeticizing of violence in exaggerated or politically charged fashions. There you go. A gazelle is an Arabic form of poetry. It's composed of a minimum of five couplets. Remember, a couplet is two lines of poetry. Um, they're not rhymed. However, they are structured thematically and emotionally autonomously, meaning that each little couplet, each two-line section is going to have nothing to do with the others. They're established to be like a string of pearls and a necklace, not a continued line of poetry or a narrative, right? And the only similarity of linking portion is a refrain that occurs in the end of the first two lines and then the end of every other line from there out, right? For example, um, that's fine here. Here we go. What will suffice for a true love not, even the rain? But if he bought grief's lottery, bought even the rain... So there's the opening couplet, right? You have the refrain, which is even the rain, ending both lines. Following that, the next couplet will have the ending the, or even the rain only in the last of the lines, right? So you say, our glosses wanting in this world, can you remember? Anyone, when we thought the poets taught even the rain. After we died, that was it. God left us in the dark. And as we forgot the dark, we forgot even the rain. Okay, so you see how even the rain is ending the second line and every one of the couplets following the first when it ended both lines, right? That's the refrain. That's how a gazelle is structured. So you have to repeat as many times up to 15. Usually it's less than 15, but 15 is the max. That's a gazelle. Okay? Ta-da. Here's more examples of that and more detail about the form, but that's all you need to know, really. Persian, the language that Rumi was writing in, and Rumi spoke, right? It's spoken in Iran, like Arabic, without strict grammar as far as the way it looks and the way it sounds. There's no grammatical rules really in, in Persian, which is also called Farsi. So Persian Farsi is the language of Rumi, language of Iran, language of Persians, not of Arabs, right? So Arabic is what Hafez spoke. It's spoken in the Middle East and North Africa. Language of the Quran is classical Arabic. So it's spoken in Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, uh, parts of Israel, uh, parts of Pal or all of Palestine, um, Oman, Qatar, Bahrain, uh, Yemen, if I didn't say Yemen already, Algeria, Tun Tunisia, uh, Egypt, Morocco, 
Um, Sierra Leone. Uh, much of North Africa speaks Arabic as well, not Pashto, and not which is spoken in Afghanistan, and not um, Persian Farsi, which is spoken in Iran. There we go. All right, Bedouin. Bedouin were the pre-Islamic tribes of the Arabic deserts, nomadic, pagan, or animist in religion. Right before the Islamic um, thing happened, before the Islamic conquest happened, before. Um, Muhammad received revelation from Archangel Gabriel and established the Quran, right? All pre-Islamic poetry was spoken word. It was spoken poetry. It was traditional folk poetry that was given to the, from Bedouin tribes to other Bedouin tribes through oral recitation at dinner and nighttime, right? That's how it was carried on. It was cultural in nature, right? Quranic verse. Post-Islamic conquest, obviously, post Quran's establishment. Um, the Islamic caliphates and empires and dynasties set it up that it was the only acceptable use for poetry, right? Only thing you can use poetry for is to write Quranic verse or to explicate and describe Quranic verse, Hadith, Surah, etc. Anything else, any secular use or talk about love or anything is halal or is haram rather, is terrible, it's bad, don't, don't mess with it. Pashtun is the ethnic majority in Afghanistan, right? Um, they're also, Pashtun is a language which is the language spoken by the Pashtuns in Afghanistan, right? Helmand is a province in Afghanistan where the most violent fighting in the U.S. occupation, OEF, Operation Enduring Freedom, occurred. Um, it's relevant somewhat to Brandon Courtney's poetry and somewhat to my poetry, but just know what Helmand is that province. Al Anbar, similarly, is a province in Iraq. It's where both Fallujah, or not both, where all Fallujah, Tikrit, Ramadi, and Samarra are located. It's part of what's known as the Sunni Triangle, which is the triangle that's created between Baghdad, Ramadi, and Tikrit. Or no, Baghdad, Ramadi, and Fallujah, sorry. It's in the northeast of Iraq. It's where some of the most violent fighting between the first and second battles of Haditha occurred, right? A mirror for a mirror for the 20th century, a mirror for the executioner, a mirror for life, a mirror for death. This is Adonis's poetic method and his thematic use to describe political issues in his poetry. Unlike Darvish, he does not go straight in and say, "Here's political, political, political violence." No, he puts a mirror. He says, "A mirror for the 20th century," and in symbols and images, he describes the violence and the longing and loss of the 20th century. He doesn't do it explicitly. He does it through symbolism and poetic figuring, right? Unlike Darvish, who's like, "Here's bad crap that happens. It's violence. Don't like it. Done." All right. The following should be recent enough from our discussions. You can fill them out on your own, hopefully. Um, the Spanish Inquisition. This is all related to the Grand Inquisitor and Dostoevsky, remember? So what's the Spanish Inquisition? Not the Monty Python, skip the actual establishment and a thing. Look that up if you don't know. Find it out. Ivan Karamazov, remember? The older brother who's telling the story of the Grand Inquisitor and wrote the poem, The Grand Inquisitor. He's a college professor and a secular atheist. Remember that? Uh, existentialism is the philosophy of Sartre, Camus, Kierkegaard. They derive it from Dostoevsky via Nietzsche, who says, oh, Dostoevsky's a great existentialist writer. And everyone's like, oh, yeah, everybody leaves Nietzsche. Cool, right? So that's that. Underground man, find out who he is, look him up. First temptation of Christ, second temptation of Christ, third temptation of Christ, both in Scripture, the Bible, New Testament, and also in the Grand Inquisitor. So that is all we have for the study guide. Hopefully that helps out. We went through it all. Um, you'll not be responsible for anything other than what I mentioned here, as well as the poems that we read in uh, the semester, i.e. like The Inadequate Grave, Adonis, Darwish. I might quote some poems from those on the paper, on the test, so be ready to do that. Um, other than that, I think we're straight. Thank you all very much. Um, we'll see you on Thursday. Thursday the 6th is the final at 10.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. Same room. If anybody needs to take it early, that's fine. Contact me. I'll set up an early time for you to take it. Monday, I'm free all day. If anybody needs to take it other times in the week, let me know. I can set something up for you. We'll be good. Any other questions, hit me up on my email or group me. 